Bonjour, je vais excuser Thomas Lecuy qui ne pouvait pas être là aujourd'hui et qui est en Allemagne. Et donc on va écouter, I'll say it in English. We will listen to the second lecture of Rob Phillips. He will speak English. He doesn't want to speak French because he has problems with the subjunctive tense. He doesn't know how to use it, so he prefers to speak English. And he, I, from what I understood last week, he will talk about what he calls stemness. I understood like this would be what I would call universality, but it just told me that it's not the same thing. So we will discover that together. Sounds good. Thanks. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming. And uh, it remains a huge privilege to be here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, continue on this theme of biology by the numbers. So just as a reminder, the idea of this particular mini course is to introduce four themes. And I'm trying to be cognizant of the idea that these are supposed to be public lectures. And so I'm trying to balance between technical insights from science, but also sort of large scale views of the way that science unfolds. And today, what I want to do is talk about, as Jean-Francois just said, uh, sameness. And I'll explain what I mean by that as I go along. So the outline of the talk goes something like this. I'm going to start out by trying to explore what I even mean by this idea of sameness. And I hope that you'll find it interesting and be persuaded. Uh, the second part will be a, a focus on a very, very important idea of sameness in the context of biology, which is known as allosteri. And I'll try to say in some detail what I mean by that. And then uh, the final part of the talk will be about the use of mathematics to try to capture this idea of allosteri using the principles of statistical mechanics. And again, I will, I will try to, to make all of those ideas clear as I go along. So last week, I argued that there's, in some sense, almost a tension between what I would call the, the quest for factual knowledge and the quest for conceptual knowledge. And I think that's a very, very important distinction. If I tell you that tides are higher at full moon, today is full moon, I think. So the tides in Biarritz today are the highest that they will be in this month. I know that. I don't need to go there to see that. So that's a factual statement. But if I wanted to tell you uh, when high tide will be on Christmas Day in 2024, at what time and what the height of the tide will be to with centimeter resolution, that's not something that's factual knowledge. It's based on conceptual knowledge having to do with the law of gravitation and fluid mechanics and so on. So last week, I argued that there's very beautiful and also enlightening factual knowledge. For example, we know things about the structures of ion channels, and that's going to be one of the topics that I discuss today. We know things about the very interesting relationship between how much current passes through them, and then the concentration of some ligand which actually causes these channels to open and close. But what I want to say is that it's very interesting and, and perhaps even more powerful if we can go beyond this factual thinking and focus instead on what I would say conceptual thinking. And so, as I said, today I'm going to try and argue for a conceptual unification, if you like, of a bunch of different classes of macromolecules using the tools of statistical mechanics and culminating in this one key equation, which I hope to at least give you a feeling for as I go along. So last week I talked about uh, the, the, this very nice comment from Feynman where he said, as we look into these things, we get an aesthetic pleasure from them directly on observation. But there's also a rhythm and a pattern between the phenomena of nature, which isn't apparent to the eye, but only to the eye of analysis. And it's these rhythms and patterns which we call physical laws. So let me give you some examples of what I'm going to call sameness, OK? I already showed this last week, but I just want to point it out again. So I told you that Newton had this notion that if he stood on a mountaintop, labeled here by V, and he shot a projectile, if he shot the projectile sufficiently slowly, then what would happen is it would travel in a parabolic trajectory and it would fall and hit the Earth. On the other hand, if he shoot this fast enough, it will actually keep falling over the horizon, and that's what we call an orbit. And so, in some sense, I'm gonna, th this is a little bit of a sloppy usage of the worst word sameness, but in a way, what I'm saying is that the projectile motion and the planetary motion 
are the same underlying phenomenon. Here's a more powerful example. The details don't really matter, but let me just try to give you a sense of it. So there's a very idealized sort of toy system that one thinks about in physics all the time, which is you consider a mass moving on a table, and it's got a spring. And what I do is I initially pull the mass off of the equilibrium position, and then I let go. And the mass will oscillate back and forth. If I have uh, friction between the mass and the surface, it will damp out over time. If I don't, it will keep on going indefinitely. And I think, you know, I might have mentioned this last week, I don't remember anymore, but when I first learned about these things, I thought it was kind of mind-numbingly boring. I, I wondered, you know, what's, what's the deal with physics where you, ha you imagine all these toy problems? And I think the real enlightenment came for me when I learned about an electrical circuit that had a capacitor and what's called an inductor. And in the end, one realizes that that is actually the same system. And so the, the point that I would make is that these two examples are a concrete example of what I mean when I use the word sameness. What I mean is that one could have some laboratory that works on electrical circuits. They would be thinking about this thing. You could have some mechanics laboratory where people are thinking about a pendulum, for example. And when all the dust settles at the end, one realizes that, in fact, these are both examples of what we will call simple periodic motion. And there's power to that, because what we learn in this context can actually be exported to this context. All we have to do is change the names of the variables. A more sophisticated example that really still, to this day, confuses, and I shouldn't say confuses, but really excites me, is that of the relationship between diffusion and polymers. So let me just say a little bit about that. If I have a, a glass of water like this, and I were to put some food coloring, I take a pipette and I put some food coloring right at the center, and I had this thing sitting there really still, what we would find out is that over time, the, color, the food coloring would diffuse, it would spread out. And the way that I could illustrate that, I did this I think last week, is, uh, is by using the physics of what's called a random walk. And in order to, to convey this idea, let me just show you. So I'm going to ask people whether they were born on an even or an odd day. We'll start with Jean-Francois again. Even or odd? Yes. Even. even. Professor Buch, even or odd? Born on even. What about you? Even or odd? Even or odd? Somebody want to answer me? How about you? Even or odd? Even. Even, wow. Odd. Even. Odd. So what am I doing? I'm showing you a random walk. What do I mean by a random walk? I mean that the particle basically is flipping a coin, and depending on whether the coin is a head or a tail, it moves to the right or left. And that means that the position over time spreads out, but it spreads out in a very interesting way where the width goes like the square root of time. Now let's imagine a completely, apparently different problem. Let me take a string of paper clips, and I drop it on this table. It'll form a blob, and I can measure the distance between the two ends of the paper clip chain. And I can do that over and over again. And now if I do it a second time with a longer paper clip chain and I drop it, then it'll, it will form a larger blob. And it turns out that the math that we use to describe that if you look carefully, you'll see this tells me the concentration at position x at time t. This tells me the position of the end after, and that shouldn't be a t, that should be an n. I made a mistake there. Um, this then will tell me the width of the polymer. And so what I'm trying to say to you is that in, in, a, in some way, very interestingly, the problem of diffusion and the problem of polymer, just the seemingly very different problem of the structure of a polymer can be thought of as being the same underlying phenomenon of random walks. And what I'm going to tell you about today is, this is, this is a preface, this is just to, to give you a sense of where I'm headed, I'm going to tell you about the sameness of many different types of macromolecules which exhibit the phenomenon of allosteric. And again, I, I will elaborate on that as we go along. So where does this, this, the topic of today's um, course come from? For me, in part, it comes from what I would call a fascination with the tension that one could say that exists between our quest for understanding the diversity of the living world, something that Darwin, in this very famous notebook of his, he drew this phylogenetic tree, his early sort of nascent thoughts, 
And I love the fact that he said, I think, in his notebook. And then this is his notion of how life diversified. And here I give you six of my favorite examples. So this is from the Cambrian. Maybe many of you have not seen this before, but this is a single-celled organism called Stella humosa. I just want you to wrap your head around the fact that this thing has the shape of the Star of David. You're looking at it in the process of cell division. This is Emiliana Huxleyi. This is responsible for the large blooms that are light blue that you see from space, for example, off the coast of England or off the coast of Alaska. A deep sea anglerfish, uh, a Venus flytrap, and a blue whale. So these really give us a sense of the diversity of life. But I think that you know, it could be said that maybe sometimes we spend too much effort on thinking about the diversity of life to the exclusion of wondering about the unity of life. What is it that gives living organisms and the molecules that, that make them tick their similarities? And so with that as my background, what I want to do is I want to talk about Alistairi as biology's sameness, okay? So let's start here. So this is very complicated. I don't expect you to really understand it too much or think about it very hard, but it all goes back to this. If you eat some glucose, that glucose will undergo a series of chemical changes, the details of which do not concern us. Although I kind of, what I think is kind of neat about this is these are the molecules in scale, drawn to scale, and these are the enzymes that act on these molecules as they proceed through the process of what is called glycolysis. Maybe some of you have been forced in some course to memorize the glycolysis pathway. Uh, you know, for me, that's kind of an unbearable thought. But the point I want to make is shown over here. And let's look at this one in particular. PFK is an acronym that stands for phosphofructokinase, which you can see right here. It's a very beautiful enzyme. And these red molecules inhibit this, and the green ones activate it. And the question is, you know, how does a molecule, how does an enzyme know, with quotes, I'm anthropomorphizing, how does it know that there's some ligand around, some effector that's telling it, change your behavior. Okay, so that's, that's a very good example of what I would call a question in Alistairi. And that's gonna bring us back to um, the 1960s. So in the early 1960s, people were thinking very hard about control and feedback. And the question, if you like, in general terms was, how is it that an enzyme would know that it should either reduce its enzyme action or alternatively increase its enzyme action? That's the question that people were pondering over. And it came from many different directions, this, this kind of question. And um, what happened is, you know, a few kilometers from here at the Institut Pasteur, um, there were several very important papers. The first one by, um, that you see here, which is Monod, Change, and Jacob. And then a second one by Monod, Wyman, and Change. And simultaneously in Berkeley, um, Arthur Pardee and John Gerhardt were engaged in similar thoughts, similar questions, similar puzzles, which is, I, I think I could say it in sort of naive terms, which is, if I think of an enzyme as having a little pocket where a molecule goes in order to be transformed, for example, to be cut, and then I imagine that this particular enzyme can be inspired to work at a higher rate, the question was, you know, what would you do? How would it structurally work that this pocket gets amended by the presence of some molecule whose job is to activate or excite the molecule to further action? And so these, this group and also the Berkeley group were trying to think that through, and they came up with this idea that there were separate sites for where the part of the molecule that was doing the control from that part which is doing the activity. So in a, in a way, I, the question I want to ask, and you know, this is a question we can ask about all sorts of things in life. You know, we can ask it even about ourselves and our responses to our environments. You know? And that is, there's some sort of an input-output curve. So here what I'm showing you is the output on the y-axis, and on the x-axis, this is the concentration of some effector. It could be tension in a membrane, it could be the concentration of some molecule, it could be voltage or whatever, and this red curve is the input-output behavior. And what I want you to notice is that there's a few things, if I were to call my mom and I wanted to talk to her about this molecule, I would tell her, well, you know, even in the absence of a driving force, it's a little bit leaky. It gives an output even when I'm not driving it. 
So that's what I'm going to refer to as the leakiness. There's some midpoint, which I will refer to as the EC50, the midpoint where when you put the driving force to this value, you get halfway to the maximum output. And then there's also this notion of the dynamic range, which is how much of a shift do you get between the, the sort of null behavior and the maximal behavior, which we will refer to as the saturation. So the question is, you know, how, how does evolution take advantage or alter these properties? And also, how does physiology tune these properties? In other words, there are different time scales in biological phenomena. There's the physiological time scale of, as I told you all last week, if I'm given the opportunity to eat foie gras or donuts, for me, it's donuts all the way. I eat my donuts, and now my body has to adjust to the presence of some sugars. There are going to be some enzymes that come into action. And so there will be a response. And that's a physiological adaptation. But there's also evolutionary adaptation, which is to say, for example, I can just pose a question. Let's say that I decided, and my, uh, my children and their children all decided to live at 6,000 meters or 5,000 meters, somewhere in the Andes. One could ask the question, will there be changes to their hemoglobin? We already know this to be true, for example, in, um, in terms of the uh, bar-tailed, uh, maybe it's, a, I forgot, it's a particular kind of goose that flies over the Himalayas. We actually know that their hemoglobin is different. Or, for example, the myoglobin in the hemoglobin in whales is different than ours. So that's an evolutionary adaptation. So the answer that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer and that we're going to talk about for the remainder of today is this idea of the Alistairy concept. So let me try to summarize it for you naively. And that is the idea that many of the macromolecules that power cellular life can exist in two states, one of which I will refer to as inactive, the other of which I will refer to as active. And here I give you three distinct examples. So this ion channel, which sits in a membrane, it can be closed or open, and when it's open, it permits ions to fly, flow through. Here's an enzyme, which in this conformation is inactive, and it gets into a different state where it's active, and it can then do its job on this substrate. And then finally, there are many membrane receptors, which in the absence of some ligand, they don't do anything, and then in the presence of a ligand, they do. This notion of allosteric, you know, it's, it's always funny to ask where words come from. So, you know, I'm very interested in entropy, and that's a word, I think, that Clausius came up with. He tried to re refer to his roots. I'm always amu amused in biology by things that have S-O-M-E at the end. So chromosome, what's that, what's that really mean? It means uh, colorful bodies. You know, you give a name to a thing because it's a colorful body. And in physics, we have all sorts of things that end with O-N-S, phonon, magnon, spinon, whatever, exciton. And so Alistair, um comes from the Greek word, allos, other, and stereo, solid. Um, and I guess I would just say that this, for my mind, it's, it refers to the fact that the, the regulatory site is distinct from the enzyme site. So let me give you some examples of how this plays out in cells. So this green outline is meant to be, a, it's a poorly drawn cell. And uh, here, um, this is some receptor that sits on the surface of the cell. And when there's no ligand bound to it, then this whole pathway is shut down. And so these objects are basically off. In the presence of this ligand, now you see these things change shape. And that turns on this enzyme. It releases this transcription factor from the gene. And so the gene turns on. And it releases this tethered blue thing so that now cytoskeletal proteins can lead to cell motility. So I wanted to say a few words about how I came to my interest, in, my deep interest in this subject. So in 2013, there was a meeting at the Pasteur. Um, and as it says here, in the 50 years since the introduction of allosteric interactions, this concept has become one of the pillars of structural, molecular, and cell biology, along with the flow of information via the genetic code, since regulation must continually modulate biological processes. So I am a, a, a typical of a generation of people that originally were trained in physics that decided to switch to biology because they thought it was so cool. Um, and I just wanted to give you a sense of the importance that some people attach to this notion of allosteric. So there's a very well-known biologist who I think I will leave unnamed, but super well-known, who once told me that he, would ref he refused to talk to physics types that were switching to biology until they could define allosteric for him. And I thought, it was a, I thought it was funny, and I could see where he was coming from. 
So, um, so at any rate, this meeting was extremely interesting. And there were many, many sort of representatives of very distinct fields. So there were people that were there to talk about ion channels. There were people talking about surface receptors, so-called G protein coupled receptors. There were people talking about uh, transcription factors. There were people talking about hemoglobin. And the list is long. And they all, they all were giving talks. And as I was listening, what I said to myself um, was how odd that they don't actually acknowledge that each other's work is really, if you'll forgive me, the same. Okay, and so, you know, what I, I left that meeting thinking to myself, it's a pity that they are not thinking of this in the way that, for example, we think about interference. So let me say why I'm bringing this up. Already at the time of Newton, we're talking the 1660s, Britannia rules the waves. Uh, the British were already sailing to what is now uh, Vietnam. And they knew that in the, um, the Gulf, what we now call the Gulf of Tonkin, that there was only one high tide per day. And the ship's logs, the ship's books for captains said you need to be very careful when you go to the Gulf of Tonkin because there's only one high tide per day, not two. And I can tell you from personal experience. So I sailed a, a boat uh, 3,500 miles, six months, we got to Costa Rica, to a city called Punta Arenas. They forced you to have a pilot come out to your boat. It was a 100-foot sailboat. And the pilot proceeded to come onto our boat and ran us aground on a sandbar. And we had to await high tide and use our Boston weather to push our boat off the sand. And so why do I tell you this? Because you know, these are practical matters. And Newton, among many others, was puzzled by this single tide in the Gulf of Tonkin. There's a guy called Thomas Young. Many people think of him as like the last universal genius of uh, sort of science, although you know, I don't know how meaningful that is. But Thomas Young was interested in, um, in the interference of light. So this is a figure from Isaac Newton where he is looking, this is all of us have seen this. On a rainy day, if you had gone out this morning, you could have seen on the streets of Paris places where you would have seen different colors due to oil. And then the thickness of that oil determines what colors you see. So this is from Newton's book, and this is from Thomas Young, where he said, I think I know what's going on. And what's going on is the light gets reflected off the top surface, it gets reflected off the bottom surface, and you want to make sure that the di distance is equal to an integral number of wavelengths. That is additive, constructive interference. But this also occurs for sound waves. If you... Uh, if you happen to fly out of Ben Gurion Airport in Israel and you take a right-hand window seat, you'll fly out towards the Mediterranean and you'll see Tel Aviv on your right-hand wing and there's four jetties. I think in en français c'est une digue. There's four of them and they have holes between them. And if you look, you will see perfect, beautiful diffraction patterns. That's interference of waves. So why am I telling you this and what does it have to do with Alistair? Well, we happily talk about interference of sound, of light, of water waves. All of those things are the same. We do not, I mean, you can dig deeper and you can see the differences, but the, it's very useful to see them as the same. So that's my reason for showing this example. I already mentioned this idea of um, harmonic oscillators, and here I'm just trying to show you that the very notion of resonance is also quite general. So, you know, all of us experience resonance. Anybody that's got a kid, you know, I used to go home from grad school. Um, one of my favorite games to play with my kids, it was very obnoxious, but I loved it, was I would push them with my eyes closed. And I would push them at a frequency of my own choosing. You can imagine how well this works. If I choose the wrong frequency, sometimes I hit them on the upswing, sometimes I hit them on the downswing, but they don't get much oomph. Our older kid, you know, he's one of these guys that his dream is to be on a swing set and to get the amplitude so high, you know what he wants to do. He wants to go all the way around, you know, like that's his goal in life. And so he would like me to match him. He'd like for me to find the resonant frequency. So once again, you know, resonance exists in mechanical systems, it exists in electrical systems, it exists for pendula. This is light passing, infrared light passing through a thin film of material. So those are all examples of commonality, of sameness. And what I wanted to say <laughs> is that Biology has such concepts. So this is 
Oh, well, we won't hear that. That's too bad. Anyway, what is this? That guy is Gandalf, and he's in the process of saying uh, to Frodo that there's one ring that rules them all and in the darkness binds them. This is the ring. Well, anyway, this is Elvish for the MWC model, and it says there's one equation to rule them all, which is this one. Okay, so that's kind of my background on Alistair. So now let me try to actually get serious about, you know, what would it take to try to, to take the qualitative thinking about Alistair and turn it into a corresponding mathematical description. So let me try to walk you through several examples. So the first example I want to give you has to do with ion channels. So I'm sitting here moving around. That's because my muscles are being actuated and the, the way that that happens is because signals come from my brain, they arrive at my muscle fibers, and in those muscle fibers are, um, so th basically this neuron is essentially in contact almost with my muscle. And what happens is that these little circles, which are spherical vessels, vesicles, they release small molecules which have to travel across this, say, roughly 30 nanometer gap, uh, you know, very, very tiny gap. And when these molecules attach to one of these ion channels, they transiently open it up, leading to the flow of charges and a change in the membrane potential, which turns out to lead to muscle action. And so what I want to do is I want to focus on the behavior of these ion channels. And let me just say, you know, the ion channel is a glorious example of the role of conceptual knowledge as opposed to just factual. When Hodgkin and Huxley originally posited their model for how electrical action takes place in, in our bodies, they had to hypothesize the existence of ion channels. They had to actually make an educated guess, and there's a whole host we now know of different categories of ion channels. So this gray bit right here is supposed to be the membrane. Just as a reminder, that's about four nanometers thick. Uh, if you want to have a sense of this. Um, the next time you get on an airplane, when you're standing in the doorway, I just did this yesterday, and I always do. I grabbed the fuselage, and I held it for a moment on my Air France flight. And I did it because I wanted to remind myself that the thickness of the fuselage relative to the diameter of the plane is the thickness of the membrane relative to, for example, the size of a bacterium. And so this little thin layer is what separates the inside of the cell from the out. And there are a series of proteins that live in the cell membrane whose job it is to transiently open up and permit the flow of ions across the channel. These, these channels can be gated, that's the technical word, they can be turned on by either a voltage or the binding of some ligand or by a mechanical tension in the membrane. All of those different categories of ion channel exist. How do we know about these channels? Well, in a you know, kind of stunning factual thing, uh, in the 70s, people figured out how to grab a little patch of membrane to excise it from a cell. They then plunge it into some solution with electrodes, and then they measure the current passing through this thing, and this is what a current trace looks like. So basically, this little, uh, this little sort of spike corresponds to the channel transiently opening, which leads to a current flow, uh, through the, the channel, and then it closes again, and it opens and closes. And so we know that because we can, at this point, routinely, I have to say, measure the properties of individual channels. So let me try and give you a sense of, you know, what comes out of such measurements. So what's plotted here is the current through, through a channel, and on this axis is the concentration, meaning how many molecules of the ligand that gates the channel. So how many of these red guys are there? So you can see that as you increase the number of red guys, what happens is the channel here, when there's zero current, it's closed, and the more of this ligand you put in, it increases the probability of being open. The reason there's five different curves is because people are very curious about what happens when you mutate these channels. They behave differently. Some of you um, might know, um, I'm, I'm gonna need somebody's help for the, what the name is in French, but in English it's cystic fibrosis. Musco, mus, mucosov, oh. Thank you, Thibault. Say it again. Exactly. So cystic fibrosis. Single, it's a single mutation. 
in a chloride transporter. And you know, it, it leads to basically the constitutive properties of the thing being different. Just as a comment, every chloride ion that goes across the membrane carries with it about 400 waters, if I remember correctly. I tried to calculate this one time. So there's a, you know, they're pulling water along, and that leads to a complete mess up of how the things work. So this is a series of probabilities. What's being plotted basically is the probability that the channel's open as a function of how much drive you put on the system. So what I'm going to try to do is I want to I want to get out of the language of cartoons and words. So you know, here's the structure of this channel, and this is a cartoon of it in the cl the closed conformation. Here's a con a con uh, a cartoon of it in the open conformation. And what I want you to notice is these two binding sites where the acetylcholine has bound to this thing. Okay, so another kind of sameness. What I want to do is I want to figure out how can I calculate the pro relative probability of this versus that? How do I calculate the probability of the thing being open? And so I just want to say again, you know, this whole notion of sameness, there are many, many problems which when viewed through the language of probability can be seen to be the same thing. Let me give you an example. Let's talk about coin flips. So I can think about um, when a cell divides, I can think about the partitioning of the proteins as being a coin flip problem. It's very useful. It's a fiction in a way, but it's a very useful fiction. And, and actually, in some sense, it's, it's actually true. Um, we can also think about this in the context of the mating of a small population of flies as their eye color changes. It's the flipping of a coin, but it's an unfair coin. Even the number of mutations in my genome when a cell divides can be thought of as a coin flip, although it's an extremely dishonest coin. You know, one in a billion heads, but it's still a coin flip. And that leads to, you know, if you're really careful about it, it leads to the Poisson distribution, but that's another story. So I want to calculate probabilities, and to do so, you know, this is, I, I told you last week, I, I, don't, I don't have any clue how to give a, a course that would be considered a public lecture that would be satisfying to people that work in the field, I have no idea. So I'm just faking it. But the, the idea that I had was we're going on a safari, I've got a pair of binoculars, I'm like, hey, look over there, it's the Boltzmann distribution. So that's what I'm doing right now. I'm just telling you there's a really, really powerful, cool idea developed in the 19th century that tells us how to compute the probabilities of different states of a particular complex system. And it all comes down to this. The probability of a system depends on the energy of the state that you're interested in. And it's given by this very interesting expression, the e to the minus, and then the energy of that state divided by this quantity, kBT, which is, I'm going to call it the natural energy scale of molecular biology. It's 4.1 piconewtons per, per uh, nanometers. If somebody wants to ask me about it, I'm happy to do so. So we can use this to compute the probability that the channel is open. So here's, here's the state when it's closed. Here's the state when it's open. I assign to the closed state an energy epsilon closed. I assign to the energy when it's uh, an energy epsilon open when it's uh, open. And then I can compute the relative probabilities of these two things by taking e to the minus and then the energy divided by kT. I've just represented 1 over kT with beta. And so the sort of thing that comes out is you calculate the probability of this thing being open and closed. So what does this all have to do with uh, Alistair? So this, this now gets a bit technical, but let me at least walk you through what the idea is here. The claim is that there are eight states for the ion channel, such as the nicotinic acetylcholine recep receptor. Why do I say eight? Because it can be closed. It's got these two binding sites. They're empty. This one could be occupied. That one could be occupied, or they could both be occupied. That's four states. And then in the open state, empty, bound here, bound there, and then both bound. So that's eight possible states. And I want to know the probability that it's open. Well, this is open, that's open, that's open, and that's open. So if I want to know the probability that it's open, I take the probability of these four states together, and I divide by the, or I, yeah, I add up the probabilities of all four of these states. And the way I get that is by summing up the statistical weight of all eight states. That's the denominator. So this is the, this is the equation that I said is the one equation that rules them all. There's a few observations for me to make. First, C, this concentration, is the concentration of the, lig the red ligand. If you look at this closely, notice that when C goes to 0, then I'm left with e to the minus beta e over 1 plus e to the minus beta e. This thing, that's the leakiness. 
It tells you how much the thing will be open even without ligand around. Um, the next thing to notice is that this, and this is to my mind, I'm not sure others would agree, but the brilliance of the model that was laid down by the people at Pasteur, Mona Wyman and Shanja, was they realized that this protein likes to bind the red thing differently when it's open versus closed. And that's represented by this parameter, kappa or KD. This tells me how strongly the ligand binds to the open state and the closed state. Let me just say that again, because it's, re it's really the, a brilliant part of their thinking, which is you have a molecule. It can exist in an inactive state and an active state. We know that that molecule can bind some ligand, which tends to cause it to change its conformation. And what they found, or what they asserted, was that there's a different strength of binding in those two, two different states. So what, what you can do is, I showed you this data earlier, you can show that this particular equation describes all the data. This is the, this is the wild type, or the non-mutated. And then these four things correspond to one mutation, two mutations, three, and four. Uh, in the channel. But more importantly, what I want to do is I want to, you know, again, this is in some sense tourism, but I want to try to convey an idea here. So in the lab, we do experiments. And often the way we do experiments, we use a pipette. And we pipette clear liquids. And they contain different amounts of different chemicals. And I'm going to call those pipetter variables. But it turns out the cell has its own considerations. It has its own desires, or it has its own variables that it cares about. And I think I can illustrate that best up here. So here I'm showing you uh, a ligand. This is a receptor. The ligand the receptor can form a pair. And this curve that I'm showing you here tells me the probability that this thing is a ligand receptor pair as a function of how much ligand I have present. So when I have no ligand present, clearly it's in this state. When I have tons and tons of ligand present, it's saturated, meaning all the receptors are occupied by ligand. But different receptors have different affinities. They have different stickiness. And so the blue guy is much less sticky than the red guy. But what I'm showing you here is this variable is not the natural variable. It's not the variable that the system cares about. What the system cares about is actually C normalized by the so-called dissociation constant. When you work in that language, all the curves fall, or all the data falls on one master curve. This is known as a data collapse. And all I wanted to show you is that this is not a fit. So this is all the experiments that were done by Labarca and company. And all that we did here, in going from this picture to that one, is to plot things in terms of the correct or natural variables of the problem. Now, again, I realize I'm being somewhat technical, so let me try to convey the message here. The message that I want you to leave with is the idea that when we work in the lab, we, might, we, we choose variables that in some sense are chosen at our own convenience. But we, we need to at least consider the possibility that those variables are not the ones that the system cares about. We might need to choose some dimensionless variable, which is the natural variable of the problem. And I'm trying to make the claim here that what I'm going to refer to as the Bohr parameter is the natural variable of the problem. So who is this Bohr, and what does this have to do with anything? It turns out, probably many of you know, that the Bohr family, uh, this Danish family, is sort of a, a family of scient scientific nobility. So uh, it started with Christian Bohr, who was a Danish physiology. He's the father of both Niels Bohr and Harold Bohr. Um, and he was famous for his work on hemoglobin. And one of the things he discovered, we now refer to as the Bohr effect. It has to do with the fact that when you change the pH or you change car uh, carbon um, CO2, C carbon monoxide, all sorts of things, you will shift these binding curves. And so that came to be known as the Bohr effect. And the thing that I'm trying to say is that this effect discovered here is actually, once again, I'm going to use this notion of sameness, is the same as this family of curves. And yet, both for hemoglobin and for the ion channel, they all can be brought onto one master curve. OK, so I gave you uh, this example of ion channels and allosteric. What I want to do now is switch gears and give you one other example. Uh, and this time, it has to do with genes and how they're turned on and off. So ostensibly, this is a very different topic. And I guess one of the ways that I like to think about this
is I like to imagine the way that different kinds of books represent biological knowledge. So if you were to go to a standard molecular biology book, then the subject of ion channels and transcription could be 500 pages apart. But I'm going to make the argument that there is a reasonable way to think about this problem in which they appear on the exact same page when viewed through the lens of this notion of Alistair. So just as a reminder, so probably all of, all of us know, you know, our, the genetic information is stored in the DNA. When a gene of interest is turned on, what happens is that the information contained in the DNA is, uh, undergoes a process known as transcription, where an RNA molecule is produced. That RNA molecule, in turn, is, uh, is recognized by the ribosome, which converts the RNA information into a series of amino acids. But this picture, as shown here, in the absence of these things, is incomplete. And this also is fun, because this brings us also back to Jacob and Monod. So in the early 60s, they articulated their ideas about gene regulation, and they introduced uh, the so-called repressor operator model. And in that model, the thought was that, oh, there's proteins that bind onto the DNA, and when they do so, they shut the gene down for business. So there's a whole ho we, we now know that there's a whole host of different regulatory interventions. Uh, here I show you the example of lactose regulation. So in this case, um, what, what you see is at low concentrations of lactose, this thing is bound to the DNA and it shut the gene down for business. If there's a lot of lactose around, this particular gene needs to be turned on. And so what will happen is that this blue molecule undergoes a conformational change and it falls off the DNA thus permitting the molecules that turn the gene on to, uh, to do their business. In this case, this is a, also very interesting. Some of you might remember tryptophan is an amino acid, and the cell is very particular about making sure that the relative amounts of ATP and ADP are kept constant, the, that the relative amounts of different amino acids are maintained, that purines and pyrimidines are kept at the appropriate concentration. And you can see what happens is when there's a lot of tryptophan around, this particular green guy is bound to the DNA and the gene is off. And then when there's not much tryptophan around, this green guy falls off and now tryptophan synthesis can start. So that's cool. Um, so we know, you know, tons of examples. And this process of, that I'm referring to is called induction. So when I, when I show pictures like this, what I'm showing you is the induction of a gene, meaning that you turn up the concentration of some ligand, and that leads to the turning on of a gene. You know, this is the sort of thing you could do very routinely in the lab using all sorts of different measure, uh, techniques for measuring the gene expression. So as I showed you earlier, you know, the, there's input-output curves. And just like a minute ago I showed you this for ion channels, now I'm showing it for a case in transcription, a case in gene expression. And again, if my technical details are not of interest, I hope what is of interest is I, if, I hope you will leave with the idea of saying, oh, that's true, you know, hemoglobin has an input-output curve. Let me show it to you again. That's it. I mean, these were measurements made by Niels Bohr's father. That's the input-output curve of hemoglobin. Let me show you. I just did it. I just moved up and down the curve. I'm going to do it again. We're all doing it all the time, and we, don't take, we take it for granted. We forget that we're doing allosteric all the time, 60 times, 30 times per second or per minute. Um, we're moving up and down an input-output curve. And so, you know, this, this input-output curve is for transcription. I showed you one for ion channels. So they're very universal. And the question is, what sets the parameters? So now, I just want to say, you know, look, here is a, a, a cartoon of a transcription factor. This is our cartoon for the lac repressor, but it doesn't matter. And what I'm hoping is that you'll look at this and you'll say, hey, you already showed me that picture. It was the ion channel a few minutes ago. So I can act it out again. Here's, here's the transcription factor. It's sitting there. It's got two binding sites. It literally does have two binding sites. And so it can be empty. It can be bound by one allolactose, two, one here, or both. And it can be in this conformation or in that conformation. So there's eight states again. And I can follow the dictum of Boltzmann I'm not expecting you to see that off the top of your heads, but I'm just telling you, Boltzmann told us for generic problem, if you want to compute 
even more so Gibbs, I would say, told us if you want to compute the probability of the different states of the system, there's a very well-defined prescription. I always kind of like to kid around with uh, people in the lab because many young people that do molecular biology have to do this horrible sort of repetitive task called a mini prep where you try to get DNA out of a, of, uh, a cell. And there's a, there's a protocol. You actually, there's a little card you buy from a company and you just follow a bunch of steps and then you get your DNA at the end. And I'm just saying there's a protocol, there's a simple protocol to follow to use the Boltzmann distribution to calculate probabilities. And with a little practice, I promise you, you could do hemoglobin, you could do ion channels, you could do transcription factors, you could find out the degree of ionization of atoms in the sun. I mean, you could figure out all sorts of really interesting stuff using this idea. So, again, I, I don't mean to snow you. The details of this equation, just note, this is the one equation that rules them all. Think Gandalf. It's hidden here, but it's the same equation. And here's the input-output curve. And there's a few parameters that we didn't know. And I really just want to give you a sense of this. So, um, so what we, we had to do was um, we had to determine the parameters for this, uh, for this model, which you see right here. And once we've determined these parameters, then we can unleash our understanding to make predictions. So let me just be clear about what's going on here. What I'm telling you is that using the tools of molecular biology, we can go into a cell and we can do something such as, for example, tuning the number of copies of the transcription factor. We've done that. In other words, we've gone into the cell and we've tuned how many copies of this guy there are. We can do that by you know, tuning what's called the ribosomal binding site. So that's what I want you to see. So that's, that's the different colors. Then here, what's shown is three different strengths of binding. In other words, now, to go back here, what I'm showing you is how tightly this molecule binds to the DNA. We can tune that by changing the sequence of the DNA. So we have all sorts of parameters that we can tune, and we only had to fit one experimental curve. All of the rest of this now becomes predictive. And I guess part of the reason that I want to show this is that Mm. I have to be careful with myself. I have a tendency to speak with too much passion, but I'm going to say it. There's a defeatism on, that's on the loose. And the defeatism goes like this. Biology is too complicated. We can't make predictions. It's the, it's the result of evolution. I, I've got a whole list of reasons why we can't have quantitative understanding. And I, I guess I'm just saying, I could actually change the labels on these axes and tell you I made a prediction about some physics system and then show you this and just be like, hey, yeah, I did a condensed matter physics experiment. And you wouldn't know that this is a biology experiment. I mean, fine. If somebody wants to say to me, like, actually, I want you to say it to me, maybe you'd say, oh, look, the blue and the green dots and the blue and the green curves, they don't look that good. I'm totally open to that, because I feel like we've changed the nature of the conversation, the nature of the scientific conversation at that point. Because now we're saying, we're, we're digging deeper. We're saying, are we satisfied with this? Do you know high tide in Biarritz on December 25th next year with one centimeter accuracy and with one minute resolution? Do you or do you not? <laughs> and then that always raises the very important next question, which is, should I ask somebody in their 20s to spend five years trying to figure out whether this discrepancy is interesting or not. You know, that's a very important scientific question. Like, what's worth spending your 20s on? Because at the end of the day, you know, largely the engine of science is a bunch of 20-somethings, I would say. You know, like, I'd, I'm not cut from the category where the PIs are the king or whatever, queen. I don't like that picture. The people that are doing the stuff are the ones that are in the lab. And they're in their 20s or 30s, usually. And so, you know, it's a, big, it's a big question. Should I or should I not pursue this? But anyway, I just want you to see, you know, we can, we can do these kinds of things. And then, once again, the natural variables in this problem, I'm not going to bore you with the details, but, you know, I find it pretty fascinating that in a certain sense, when we first started doing all this kind of work, we thought each time we did a new experiment, we were doing something new and different. And then at some point, we had this realization, we just are repeating the same thing over and over and over again, 
And the, 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 what, what we're doing is we're not paying attention to the, the variables that the cell cares about. So this notion of data collapse is really interesting. And you know, for the specialists in the audience, one th there's, you know, this is like a, just a private moment with those of you that care. I would say that you know, there's a huge passion for machine learning at this point in science. And in some sense, it's viewed almost like a panacea. And I think it would be really fun to ask whether machine learning could work out or figure out for me that this is the right equation to lead to a data collapse. Again, there's no fit here. I just want to emphasize, not fitted. OK, so I, I'm basically done. Um, let, let me just give you a few con concluding thoughts. So uh, I'm pretty worried that what I said was too technical. But I hope that some of the main messages came across. One of them is this idea of sameness. So let me just restate it. I'm intrigued by and interested in the tension between a view of the living from the point of view of diversity and a view of the living from the point of view of unity. And I think that at this particular juncture in science, that we should be placing more emphasis on unity and less on diversity, although, you know, like in a parallel part of my life, I'm so interested in the diversity of life and the loss of diversity and so on. Um, you know, last week I showed you the example of how many cows on there are there on Earth and what's the ratio of our livestock and humans to wild animals. And, you know, it's 30 to 1. So obviously I care about diversity. But that said, I think it's very interesting to ask to what extent our ion channels, quorum sensing receptors, transcription factors, and nucleosomes, the same thing. To what extent is that fertile? To what extent do we learn something by saying, oh, maybe the Bohr effect described in the context of hemoglobin is actually relevant for thinking about nucleosomes, which was Leonid Mirny's great insight, I think. So we can, we can you know, draw different cartoons for these things, but the math ends up being the same and interestingly, you know, there's this sort of hidden variable that's lying beneath the surface that unifies these things and also leads to a data collapse. Another thing that I would say is that when we, when we have these kinds of quantitative models, it sharpens our questions. Like I said a few minutes ago, you know, that when I showed you this, that discrepancy could call for action. It could lead us to be dissatisfied. Newton was defeated by two problems. I think maybe I mentioned this last week. He was defeated by the three-body problem, meaning moon, earth, sun. And he was defeated by the speed of sound. He was off by 20%. He calculated it. And he was off by 20%. And he trusted the experiments enough that he said, I must not know what's going on with the speed of sound. It fell to a certain monsieur, qui s'appelle Laplace, <laughs> to figure out what's going on. And it had to do with the difference between adiabatic and isothermal compression of gas. You know, like super awesome. The discrepancy was what led to the discovery of how sound actually works. And so, you know, here uh, there, was, there was an experiment that was designed, super brilliant experiment done by Carpenter and Ruiz. And what they did is they tethered ligands. And so this really changes the story. I'm not going to go into the details, but it's a really beautiful example of the failure of the model that I told you about today. And it led to all sorts of reasoning. And actually, it was great that before, before I started, I had the pleasure of talking to Professor Buch, who worked with Manfred Eigen. And uh, in the late 60s, he sort of generalized the idea of the MWC model, as did others, including Professor Buch himself, um, to expand the class of states that one thinks about from the, the statistical mechanical perspective. I guess I just wanted to say you know, that there's an amazing power in abstraction. So maybe I mentioned this last week. I don't really know. Uh, that's one of my heroes. Uh, some of you are wearing masks right now. We're living in a pandemic. I was just, when people, you know, I come from the US. We have a lousy attitude about science. Even though everybody carries around their, their cell phones and they use one meter resolution on their GPSs, they fly around on airplanes and there's zero crashes for 10 years. But then you tell them, oh, there's a thing called a virus. They're like, oh, no, I don't, I don't think so. But, you know, Carnot died at age 36, cholera. That's, you know, that's about as serious as a pathogen gets. But he, he was interested in 
you know, what could you say in general terms about steam engines? And he came up with this big abstraction, which we now call the, uh, the Carnot cycle. And I just wanted to say, you know, that the abstraction of something like the MWC model, model is really powerful. And here, I uh, just wanted to also point out, you know, that abstraction, idealization, and simplification, although some people think of them as naive, they're in fact really the height of sophistication. And here, what I'm showing you, I'm not going to go through the details, but what I'm proving right here is that you can take a system in which there's a blue ligand and you can effectively integrate it out of the problem exactly. It's not approximate, it's not wishful thinking, it's not naivete, it's hyper sophisticated. And so you end up with a new problem in which the blue thing is gone. And, um, and I just, I love that. So um, I think I'm going to stop here. Um, let me just say that the two people that really inspired me are Leonid Mirny, who I just mentioned, and Ned Wingreen. Um, those guys really, I think, showed in a very brilliant way sort of the modern um, ways of thinking about this so-called MWC model. I hope that you maybe got a little bit of a taste for this idea of sameness. And with that, I know there's a film starting at uh, 6 um, that I, I'm going to go to about Dijen, but I'll take a few questions if people have anything they want to ask. That's it. <laughs>